Good morning and welcome all to this Family Medicine and Internal Medicine Grand Rounds program. Aging is inevitable and how we age is potentially refinable. Uh, this morning we're joined by Dr. Purvi Patel. Dr. Patel is a longstanding associate of Wellspan Geriatrics, a graduate of the University of Illinois and Ross University School of Medicine. Dr. Patel completed a family medicine residency at the McGraw Medical Center of Northwestern University and a geriatrics fellowship at North Shore Long Island Jewish Health System. This morning, Dr. Patel is gonna share with us uh, the, uh, some expertise and recommendations in uh, how we uh, address our patients in living uh, perhaps a better life as they age. And uh, of course, we welcome you, Dr. Patel, and thank you for taking the time to share with us this morning. Good morning, everyone. So today we will be talking a little bit about the healthy aging formula as it is defined by myself and what I've read otherwise as well. Um, so just a little bit about what we see in the nursing home in regards to COVID too this morning, right? We've just kind of dealt with a two years of heavy pandemic. Uh, with the vaccines, we are seeing improvement in the mortality rates in, even in the nursing home, even though it's present, we are seeing uh, minimal symptoms and uh, minimal um, mortality. So that's the positive note for this morning uh, from what we do in the community at the local SNFs and nursing homes. Uh, and so now we'll get started with my presentation on the healthy aging formula, a general overview. Um, okay, so just setting the stage a little bit, number of people uh, ages 65 and older are expected to increase. Now, I don't have um, perfect numbers on there because a lot of the data has changed over the last few years because of the pandemic. Uh, and so moving on, although it is simplest to define and categorize the elderly uh, population by age cohorts, there is a growing appreciation that the older population is physiologically and functionally a heterogeneous group. Uh, and because of the heterogeneity, uh, guidelines need to be adjusted for geriatric patients on a case-by-case -case basis. In addition, uh, most studies that we see on screening have excluded the geriatric population and this is, you know, when we talk about geriatrics, this is a population that's greater than 75 years of age uh, with minimal comorbidities. And that's hard to find for most of the studies. So uh, there is a paucity of evidence-based data on which to base firm recommendations in geriatrics. So the broad concept of health in the aged population uh, consists of three related factors, absence and pre prevention of disease, as well as maintenance of function and comfort, uh, along with presence of satisfactory support systems. And we will talk about all of these um, coming up more. Uh, the purpose of healthcare maintenance is not simply to delay and prevent disease and its attendant morbidity. Um, you know, as a family practitioner and as a geriatrician, we try to prevent um, so we try to prevent them uh, from getting the diseases in the first place. The goal is to optimize also their quality of life, optimize their satisfaction with life, and maintain their independence and productivity as well as disease prevention. Uh, so this is um, my basically like a presentation, a, uh, like a short, a one slide overview of what we look at when a patient comes to the office and all of these components are needed to maximize health. Um, and they're all interrelated, you know, and how do we optimize the quality of life? You know, a lot of it is physical exercise, eating right, and cognitive exercises are very important for our patients as well maintenance of independence and productivity. How do we do that? Exercise is a key factor in maintaining our independence, eating correctly, and also all of those put together enhances cognition. Uh, to the left, we have satisfaction with like, how do we you know, encourage our patients to um, improve their satisfaction with life? A lot of that depends on 
socialization, uh, you know, whether it's friends or faith-based, uh, managing stress. So those are some of the ways that, um, you know, some of the things that we talk about when a patient comes to our office. Um, and these outcomes, though, have been difficult to measure. And so most of the literature emphasizes the importance of a framework for individualized decision making um, to use in applying population based disease specific recommendations to individuals. And so, you know, practicing clinicians attempting to provide population based screening recommendations such as those of the USPSTF or the AHA or American Cancer Society must consider the context of overall health status of the individual patient presenting for care, as well as his or her values. And so just an example, I'm sure we all know this, but information about age associated life expectancy also can be useful in making these decisions. For instance, does an 85 year old man with renal cell CA require a colonoscopy? Um, and so social factors are also important. We look at their support systems, formal and informal, uh, accessibility, trying to get around town, you know, uh, financial support, environmental factors, you know, looking at their home safety, using the stove safely, for example, negotiating steps, wandering. Um, medical issues include fall risk, osteoporosis, exercise, vision and hearing, can't participate in activities, nutritional status, you know, are they eating correctly at home? Medications, advanced care planning, psychological concerns would include mood, evaluation of their mood, evaluation, of course, of their cognition. Um, and so there's more to come on all of these. Um, and so we're going to start a little bit about, you know, exercise. When is it too late to improve functional impairment for a patient? You know, is it ever too late? And I always say never, you know, when we see patients in our office, when is, you know, if they're having, we always evaluate them for falls. You know, have you had a fall in the last six months? Uh, we talk a little bit about gait and balance, how to improve that because that matters because of their ability to then perform their ADLs and IADLs. Uh, research is finding that staying active is one of the most potent ways to keep your brain sharp and your mood bright. Um, and so again, uh, past the age of 60, blood circulation to the brain can decline, but it doesn't have to, you know, exercise can help reverse it or improve it at least because it improves blood flow to our brain, more oxygen, more nutrients to the brain. And so we talk a little bit about ADLs. Activities of daily living include transferring, walking, bathing, toileting, grooming, and feeding. You know, these are the simple things that we take for granted. And when we lose one of those, you know, it can lead to further impairment, it can lead to fall, it can lead to, and when we fall, it can lead to hip fractures, hip fractures, you know, repair, sniff, uh, setting, placement, and that can worsen depression. It can also increase institutionalization. So, and then we see increased incidence of dementia. So the key is, and these are the instrumental activities of daily living. What are they? Managing finances, um, managing transportation, you know, patients that are no longer able to drive, uh, shopping, meal prep, house cleaning and maintenance. I mean, these are simple things that we take for granted, but you know, most of the patients that we see uh, are not able to do at least five of those things on their own. They can communicate, are able to use telephone or even the simple cell phones that they have but it's hard for them to manage their medications when you know they have ambulatory dysfunction. Uh, so it's absolutely important to exercise. Uh, exercise is beneficial for people of all ages. You know, start early and keep going. Uh, and if you haven't started, I always encourage them to increase a little bit by five percent. If they're only walking twenty steps, you know, let's try to increase your 
ambulation and your gait up to 20 steps. Uh, so there, you know, and it can reduce their all-cause morbidity. So, and what are some of the potential hazards uh, with exercising? Uh, excessively prolonged or intense activities, which, I mean, we don't ever recommend those. It's starting slow and then titrating up. Um, there's no routine pre-testing uh, for this. You know, it's simply just get moving if you're not really doing much. And so the AGS, American Geriatric Society, does have a program that it, you know, prescription for older adults with osteoarthritis. Um, and that includes training and flexibility. And typically I always say, so you start, if you're going to start a program, you want to warm up and then start with your strength training, the daily isometrics and isotonic training two to three times a week. And that could be simple arm rolls, arm circles, um, raise your arm up and down, uh, seated leg lifts, and then move on to endurance for a little bit, which would be if you're walking 10 steps, walk 20 steps. If you're walking 20, do 40. Um, and that's the endurance followed by flexibility, which is just stretching uh, to keep our muscles and um, our bones healthy. And so balance training uh, may be helpful as a means of reducing falls in the elderly, although evidence is not definitive. And so static balance training can be done by tilt, uh, tilt balance platform. I mean, that's a little bit too much. Most of my patients, um, a lot of it just is walking and stretching, uh, but there are small foams that they can buy, uh, one inch foams to improve their balance um, and it works well for them. Dynamic balance training can be achieved by Tai Chi, but this is more accessible in formal supervised setting. Now, falls in mobility, again, approximately 30% of non-institutionalized older adults fall each year. The annual incidence of falls approaches 50% in patients over 80 years of age. So it's something that is very near and dear to us in geriatrics. We see it in the outpatient setting. We see it in assisted living. We see it in the SNFs after they come in, after their hip repairs or any trauma-related fractures. And also uh, we see it within the nursing homes as well. So falls and morbidity again, uh, factors contributing to falls include age-related postural changes, decreased vision, medications, you know, a combination of medications that could be a combination of anticholinergics, sedatives, and diuretics, and, and there's many others um, in that category. Diseases affecting muscle strength and coordination also can affect that. Um, and so this is just a little, um, I guess, overview of how falls can be approached. What are the interventions that we use? What can be used outside of uh, skill settings? And so obviously medication review becomes a big thing when patients fall, you know, especially recurrently. Um, we also, you know, look at their vitals, you know, are they hypotensive? Orthostatic hypotension can be pretty significant uh, finding in the older adults. And so, of course, the interventions are based on what we see when we do the evaluation. Is it simple weakness, you know, or is it other combinations of medication toxicity or hypotension? And, um, of course, the interventions are based upon what we find in those uh, evaluations. So, you know, so is it ever too late to improve our functional impairment? I always say no, never. Even when they're in the SNFs, we, we constantly evaluate them. Even if they're in their wheelchair, we want them to move, you know, self-propel. Uh, we want them, there are programs that we've started, initiatives uh, to improve exercises in patients that are long-term care within the facilities. So uh, movement also helps osteoporosis. 
Uh, getting started is sometimes the most critical aspect of movement, especially for our patients at home. Uh, we hear a lot where they just want to sit on the sofa and watch TV. Um, so I always, always, always encourage my patients to move after, you know, whether if you're moving to go to the bathroom, coming out of the bathroom and take a walk around the house even, that helps with improving mobility. And movement also boosts brain health. Uh, so, you know, all that the good circulation that they get from that. Um, so then we're gonna talk a little bit about healthy diet as well, because that's something we constantly talk about with our patients as well. You know, it, when is it too late? Yeah, and I know our patients are a little bit older, but all of this also can be started, you know, in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, as um, we see cognitive impairment didn't just start. And there are studies that are showing Cognitive impairment doesn't just come out of nowhere and start in the 70s and 80s. It is a cumulative process that has occurred over time. And uh, so when is it too late to benefit from a healthy diet? Um, I say never. And so research is still evolving. Um, there is a lot of research. There are a lot of small data, but you know, there are longitudinal studies that are being done as well, and patients followed out for longer periods of time on this. Uh, so healthy diet, physical exercises, cognitive exercises, staying socially engaged may improve cognition. Um, and so there was a meta-analysis that I kind of thought I should present, uh, the British Medical Journal in 2008. And the good part about this study is it was a 12 study that were analyzed and 1.5 million patients were followed from three to 18 years and their diet was predominantly vegetables, legumes, fruits, nuts, cereals, fish, and seafood. Uh, the diet had less dairy products and meat products and one serving of alcohol per day. Um, now I'm not a fan of alcohol even one glass of wine for my patients, especially the ones that have um, cognitive impairment and have you know memory loss because that quickly can deteriorate their current memory and we start seeing changes. Um, but the summary of that uh, study was that they saw a reduction in overall death, reduction in death from heart attacks, cancer and reduction in diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and of, of course, you know, when we look at studies, we have to figure out, you know, what, where was a comparison group? You know, were they also following 1.5 other similar patients, 1.5 million other similar patients, or was that split up? Uh, so, but I mean, obviously they saw a reduction in uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so we talked a little bit, you know, I talked to my patients a little bit about anti-inflammatory diet as well. And what is anti-inflammatory diet? Anti-inflammatory diet, uh, you know, basically consists of eating more fruits and vegetables, eating some berries and some fruits, of course, with healthy fats, combine that with whole grains. Um, and it calls for beans and legumes and fish. And I know locally in your county, my patients all eat meat. And, you know, when we see our 80s and 90s, uh, patients that are in their 80s and 90s, I mean, these were patients that, you know, I think years ago, we look at longevity in these patients. Years ago, they were probably working harder and eating, you know, smaller amounts of unprocessed, unprocessed meats, you know, fresh meats. And so maybe that's what it is. Right now, we see a lot of processed meats. Um, so it's reduction in processed foods as opposed to cutting it out completely. Um, so, you know, what, and what are some of the healthy fats that we talked about? Um, there's avocados, a super fruit, uh, and then hemp seeds, flax seeds, walnuts, um, you know, and oils, we talked about olive oil, coconut oil, um, there's avocado oil, ghee, those are all the good fats that they can um, you know, consume. 
And so the general guidelines for an anti-inflammatory diet, more of a rainbow diet, Mediterranean diet, um, aim for variety, include as much fresh foods as possible, eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, as they have macronutrients, and that improves our gut. Also, you know, patients, we see a lot of constipation, you know, when I encourage them to start eating fresh fruits and vegetables, they start seeing improvement in their constipation. Um, eat more whole grains, you know, cutting back on white uh, bread, white pasta, eat more, again, you know, the beans, legumes, winter squashes. We're going to find increased use in winter squashes and sweet potatoes and uh, vegetables that are more you know, local as opposed to, you know, encouraging them to eat beans. We're just not going to get that here. But, you know, whatever they're eating, I want them to eat unprocessed, you know, healthy foods and in moderation. Probiotics are also very important. Yogurt, you know, patients have been treated over the lifespan with antibiotics and the yogurt just provides our bodies with full um, improved gut bacteria, if you will. And so, you know, minimizing or getting rid of white sugar, it's hard. So I always talk a little bit about moderation, you know, cutting back. If you're drinking three sodas in a day, which is not unusual, cut it back to one. And then next time I see you, we're going to cut it back completely. And, you know, a lot of them actually will follow up on that. You know, a lot of times when I see my patients, I tell them to write things down or uh, you know, when you come back, we will talk about this again and see how you're doing. And they do follow up with that. And so, again, uh, living longer with the Mediterranean diet. There was a study in the nurse's health. Um, and so, again, associated Mediterranean <clears throat> diet was associated with longer telomeres, a biomarker of aging. And it seems to be mediated by antioxidants and anti-inflammatory effects of their diet. Uh, longer telomere seems to be associated with longevity. I mean, and part of it is we don't want simple longevity. We want to optimize uh, their longevity so they have continued benefits to their cognition as well. You know, who wants to just have longevity without having, um, I guess, a good cognition? So, and here are the healthy oils again. Why are they good for us? Olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil. Like I said, there's ghee and sunflower seed oil as well. Um, they increase our good cholesterol. They decrease our total cholesterol. They decrease our bad cholesterol, if you will, LDL and triglycerides. And it reduces blood glucose and reduces blood pressure. Why is, um, I want to take a minute here and, you know, talk a little bit about blood glucose insulin resistant here as well. You know, we see patients in our office, their hemoglobin A1C, their HG A1C is 10, 11, you know, so my first then treatment is let's fix your blood sugars. When we fix your blood sugars, we can uh, then worry and improve our cognition as well. And I know it goes hand in hand when they cannot, you know, figure out how to fix it, which, you know, if they have cognitive impairment. So it, it's a lot of working together. Let's do this together. Let's, you know, treat the cognition a little bit. Let's improve the blood glucose, come back. And those patients are seen more frequently in our office. Um, same with the blood pressure, you know, and glucose again, too, glucose, have, having elevated blood glucose, you can have um, the same risk factors as coronary artery disease. It affects the brain. How many times do we see when we evaluate patients that they have microvascular changes on their CAT scan already? And so that goes towards, you know, the vascular dementias later in life. And so same with reducing blood pressure, you know, keeping blood pressure in control for our patients is huge. Um, as again, same uh, changes that we would see later on, microvascular changes in the brain. And then we see the cumulative effects of those 
uh, manifest as uh, cognitive impairment and then changes over time. And these are the changes that we can reverse. You know, if we can improve their blood glucose, if we can improve their blood pressures, um, improve their hypertension and uh, diabetes, we can reverse some of those changes to the cognition uh, as opposed to simply, um, you know, waiting for longer periods of time. That's why it's it's so important to start early with our um, changes that we want, you know, in our health. And so here we are with the anti-inflammatory diet again. Uh, so the other one. The other thing that I talk to my patients about, you know, if they can tolerate, again, uh, that's important. So omega-3 fatty acids, uh, where do we find them and why they're important for us? They improve inflammation in the body. It's used widely to improve heart health, uh, but in general, it also improves uh, brain health as well. You know, it's not simply heart, but also that is important because healthy heart equals a healthy brain as well. Um, so where do we find that? Mostly in the healthy fishes, the salmon, the sardine, herring, black cod, uh, omega-3 fortified eggs. For the vegetarians like me, I find mine in hemp seeds and flax seeds, avocados, walnuts, almonds, um, there's chia seeds as well. And then uh, for patients, I, you know, sometimes if they can't tolerate it as fish oil tends to, it can cause uh, changes to how our platelets function. So we have to be careful in who we recommend it to. Uh, fish oil supplements, one to two a day, uh, flaxseed oil supplements, or you can look for products that have both um, EPA and DHA. Flaxseed oil usually doesn't. It is higher in ALA, which then needs to be converted to EPA and DHA. Uh, but fish oil supplements provide more EPA and DHA. And um, so why are they necessary? It's a type of essential fatty acid that our bodies cannot produce. Most modern diets provide an overabundance of omega-6 fatty acids, you know, which is what is what we get from our refined vegetable oils like canola oil, uh, oils that we use or that we see that our food is fried in at the you know fast food restaurants, um, snack foods, cookies, crackers. Those are all those are all high in omega six fatty acids, um, and so we are looking for omega three fatty acids. EPA. So omega three is converted into EPA and DHA. EPA supports cardiac health and DHA, as we all know, we see children's formulas are fortified with DHA and it supports membranes of our nerve cells in the brain, helps with normal brain development and function. Um, and so they, and how do they do that? By reducing inflammation in our body. And so decreasing the heart attacks, strokes, several forms of cancer and autoimmune diseases. Uh, it's, you know, again, there's a lot of research being done, but in general, omega-3 fatty acids, you know, we've used it for years for heart, improving heart health. And also, you know, by improving our heart health, we improve our brain health as well, reducing strokes by improving our blood pressure, uh, reducing strokes by improving our blood glucose. And so a little bit about supplementation, we, so the other supplement, you know, that we kind of look at as well is a multivitamin in the older adults. We see a prevalence of suboptimal vitamin status and to improve their micronutrient status, uh, it sometimes you can recommend a multivitamin. I mean, obviously there's no prospective data that says that it has any effect on morbidity or mortality. And then um, calcium and vitamin D supplementation. Uh, and of course, there's also the pulse dose of high dose vitamin D alone. Uh, some studies have found that clinically relevant reduction in non-vertebral fractures can be achieved. Um, however, a woman, the large women's initiative, health initiative found that calcium and vitamin D are ineffective in reducing fractures over a seven year follow up. Uh, recent results 
that were uh, posted from the New England Journal on July of 2020, similar conclusion, vitamin D supplementation is ineffective in lowering fracture risk, but it doesn't mean we don't supplement our patients because they can have osteoporosis. It still improves brain, uh, our bone health. And so that is something we look at when we're looking at patients in the assisted living, in the nursing home setting, as well as in the outpatient setting, uh, because you know our bones, in, especially in women and even in men, our bones start changing you know, in the 50s, in the 40s. And so we do need, uh, you know, good amount of calcium, magnesium, vitamin D to help uh, keep our bones strong, along with exercise, of course. Um, so let's talk a little bit about cognitive exercises, very near and dear topic for us. Um, puzzles of any kind, you know, um, that I recommend to patients. If they're already doing puzzles, I say, okay, well, pick up a different type of a puzzle then. Uh, so if they're doing crosswords or searches, I, I tell them, you know, look for something that will challenge your brain now, again, in a different way. So try jigsaw puzzles or pick up an old hobby, you know, try moving, dancing, whatever it is. If you're doing one thing, look at something else. Keep the one that you really like, but try to do something else because that challenges our brain uh, significantly. And challenging the brain increases our processing speed. Uh, it improves our retention and something magical happens to our brains when we keep it active. I mean, I hear it all the time. You know, it's been 14 years and you know, countless times where patients come back and uh, when we go over, you know, their mini mental status exams again, um, they, they improve uh, in the numbers and they are stabilizing at home. We can't say we're reversing much, but we're seeing a lot more stabilization. And so let's talk a little bit about the USPSTF recommendations. Um, a checklist uh, will follow here uh, with what they recommend as interventions to prevent and to make the home environment safe and make, um, I guess, reduce injuries. So what are some of the recommendations? Of course, you know, the top ones that I always like to review, poor lighting in home, obtrusive furniture, uh, slippery floors and loose rugs. And so, you know, smoke detectors are important, but I think that's become universal. And so are safety belts and helmets. Um, but handrails and grab bars help one leg balance. We evaluate their get up and go when they come to our office. So what is get up and go? It's a simple test where a patient rises from a sitting position and walks 10 feet and returns back to their chair in a seated position um, within 15 seconds. And so a score of 15 or more means they can use a little bit of help. And those are the patients. If we then combine that with their recent fall, we then recommend that they start with physical therapy or continue to increase their movement uh, at home. And so ophthalmology-wise, sensorium-wise, you know, we used to do the eye chart um, and opto exam in our office. We now refer to ophthalmology. Uh, changes in their hearing. I'm so excited that uh, hearing aids are now going over the counter and they will be a lot cheaper. We see countless patients where, you know, they've lost hearing aids and they don't want to spend another $5,000 or $6,000. You know, they're in, on a fixed income. So I'm so glad that the prices are improving and that you will be over the counter, easier for them to pick up. And so, again, nutrition, uh, brushing their teeth, flossing, dental visits, absolutely important. Um, that's and then immunizations, of course, very important when we review patient charts. Uh, USPSCF recommendations, again, uh, sexuality, uh, absolutely important to discuss that, especially in our younger population, um, you know, initiation of the discussions. Hormonal changes start in the 40s and 50s. We have to talk about uh, in our younger population, you know, is a brain and evaluate them. Is the brain fog? Is are the cognitive changes related to the hormonal changes? Um, 
reviewing continence. You know, it's a big thing for them, uh, chronic conditions and medications. It prevents them from going out. You know, it prevents them from socializing because they're bound to the bathroom. So we have to talk to our patients and teach them how to improve that, you know, whether it's bladder or toileting. Uh, we talked about, you know, going to the bathroom two hours, every two hours, emptying up. If you're going out and if you already have plans, you know, don't take your diuretics two hours before you go out. Take it eight hours in advance or skip it and come back, come back home and then take it. Uh, so there are different ways that we can, you know, um, advise the patients on that as well. Social issues that we talked about, again, living arrangements, uh, if they're living alone, who is coming in to check on them? Uh, you know, or do they have, and if they have a caregiver, uh, support and burnout, you know, we see countless times where we see caregivers are crying in our office because it's hard for them to watch, right? Our patient who has dementia, that has cognitive impairment, can have impaired judgment and impaired um, ability to understand what is going on. And so, but the caregiver who is just as old as our patient, you know, is now performing tasks for themselves as well as their um, care, as well as their loved one who has a cognitive impairment. So, you know, sometimes we, I spend 20 minutes just talking to the caregiver providing support um, family training also in cardiopulmonary resuscitation if needed. We like to talk a little bit about advanced directives, but definitely that can be done uh, in the primary care's office as well. Um, again, activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily, if we start seeing changes, therapy, evaluation, and treatment is a must. It improves their uh, ambulation and keeps them stronger and keeps them independent and at home for as long as uh, they want to, as long as we can, you know, optimizing their independence. And so uh, effective health screening, simple and relative things that can be done in the office are MMSC, clock drawing, and the geriatric depression scale. Although now also, you know, there's a lot of uh, depression evaluation with the two simple questions that are being asked, the PHQ-2 and PHQ-9. Uh, so, but in regards to the cognition, it's simple. MMSE can take maybe five minutes or less and we can get a quick number. Sometimes though, you have to be careful. There are times when I see lower numbers of MMSE uh, that were done in the primary care office. And then when they come here, perhaps because we allow for an hour plus of visit time, and it's usually two visits, one with our social worker and one with the physician. It's a three hour time span uh, over two visits. Uh, they tend to do a little bit better just because they're a little more relaxed. And so, you know, of course, a more detailed health maintenance exam would con or and history taking would include focused physical exam, performing selected diagnostic tests, and providing certain therapeutic interventions and counseling. Of course, tobacco use patients coming in and uh, that are using tobacco, whether it's in the office, it's in the SNP setting, you know, or in assisted living, we always talk about tobacco secession. Um, it, it comes up more in the rehab because they're they're there more for um, the short term rehab and they go back home and they start their same habits. Um, and so a little bit about polypharmacy, very near and dear to us again, uh, altered pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, uh, common cause of hospitalization and morbidity in the elderly. Um, and so there are no specific recommendations by the USPSTF, uh, although reviewing their medications, including their over-the-counter medications and herbal products make sense, you know. And a lot of times they will think Tylenol is nothing or Tylenol PM is nothing, Aleve PM, Advil PM. There's so many medications that are offensive to the older adults. Uh, and a lot of times they don't realize it. I mean, 
it comes up very frequently uh, that they are using Motrin over the counter because Tylenol does nothing for them. Um, and so in those cases, you know, I always give them my data, my personal data that I kind of mentally collect. At the SNFs, you know, we use Tylenol mostly 99% of the time. There are some, you know, narcotics in patients that we cannot control their pain for a short amount of time. And then also adding um, over-the-counter muscle rub creams in combination with the Tylenol, it relieves a lot of pain. Movement also relieves a lot of pain. And so I think a lot of it is just talking to the patient and asking them to, you know, give me two to three days so I can show them what can happen. Um, so injury prevention, uh, memory impairment can lead to unsafe behaviors. Um, patients at home, we talked about burn injury. If they're using the stove and they're living alone, and if there are concerns, I talk to the families about, you know, let's not use the stove at all, pull the plug from the back, or cut the service to the stove so they don't use the stove. A lot of times, you know, they leave the oven door open and that's a fall risk or that the stove was left on, they burned the eggs, you know, it's simple things. Even though they think it's simple cooking, there are still hazards to that. Um, so of course, water temperature, smoke detectors are important and need for safer housing then also needs to be considered. But if we want the patients to remain in their house, um, because that's something, you know, of course, we nobody wants to leave their house. Um, and so those are some of the interventions that we kind of tell them about. Driving, of course, is a big thing. Physicians should advise a patient with dementia not to drive, although just advising them not to drive, uh, not really effective at times. So then we have patients that are referred to us and then we, uh, after a full evaluation, if they still shouldn't really be driving, and if there are questions though, there is a outpatient referral to occupational therapy, which uh, driving school, branch driving school locally uh, provides services behind the wheels on the road testing to see how much and where they should drive. A lot of times it's, they will say drive within a two mile radius, go to simple, you know, up the road type of a shopping trip as opposed to driving on highways. Uh, but so there are, um, ways that we can, you know, evaluate them for driving. If it's, you know, truly they shouldn't be driving, then we have to turn in uh, and be, uh, we have to report to the Department of Transportation. Advanced directives, very important. Again, clinicians should take time to assure that there isn't underlying depression when this is being done. Um, and a discussion of end of life, you know, is well suited for the health, health maintenance exams that we are now uh, doing. And, and, you know, when the focus is less on specific disease and more on prevention and planning. And so hearing and vision screening, again, uh, we used to do this in our office. Now we refer out for these services. Uh, simply because, you know, we can say this is, there is a problem. But a lot of times, you know, patients come in telling us that they have a problem with hearing and they have a problem with vision. And so it's simply referring out to the specialists. And so, of course, you know, same thing again, uh, conflicting recommendations for glaucoma screening. Uh, but again, you know, when we send them to ophthalmology, uh, they will evaluate the eye for all the eye concerns and vision uh, concerns. And so um, patient inquiry, as we said earlier, uh, patient inquiry is likely the rapid and inexpensive way to screen for hearing loss. Um, and of course, we used to do, again, tone audiometry in our office. We don't do that anymore. I am so ecstatic that, you know, hearing aids will be cheaper and that they will be over the counter. Uh, that is going to be a huge game changer for our older adults. Mental status and cognition. So the prevalence of dementia in the older adult increases with age, with estimate uh, ranging from 20 to 50% by the age of 85. Uh, and 
And so early or mild dementia may remain undetected without specific screening. Uh, but this is where, you know, the healthy diet and exercise comes in. You know, you got to start early because changes started, you know, 40s and 50s and 60s. We're not seeing our patients until 70s and 80s. And so, but even though we see them at that age, I still feel like there's so much more that can be done even then, you know, improving their diet, improving their uh, exercise programs, improving movement, improving their mood, improving um, just, you know, what they do with cognitive uh, exercises as well, socialization. Um, and so, you know, despite arrival of several medications shown to slightly alter the course of incipient Alzheimer's type dementia, it remains to be shown that early detection of dementia improves outcomes with the exception of uncommon treatable causes of dementia. Uncommon treatable causes that we might see are depression and anxiety. Sometimes, you know, when we treat that, and of course, hypothyroidism is another big one. Um, if we treat that, we see significant improvement in their cognition. Um, and so the USPSCF has concluded that there is insufficient evidence to recommend for or against routine screening for dementia in older adults. Other experts recommend screening for dementia in patients with functional impairments because of their higher rates of uh, positive screens, whether it's depression or, uh, you know, whether it's true cognitive impairments. And so because of the positive impact of counseling and advanced care planning um, as well, it is very important at that point then when we see functional impairment that we do start screening for cognitive impairment. And so um, unlike dementia, depression is usually treatable. Depression significantly increases morbidity and mortality. And of course, the USPSTF recommends screening all adults for depression. And the task force also notes that asking two simple questions, you know, uh, mood and anhedonia may be as effective as a screening tool for depression as a longer instrument. Uh, we use more of the GDS short form, which is a 15 question um, depression scale. We, in the past, we've used a 30. They're both very uh, effective in evaluating for depression. And of course, any positive screen um, and any positive screening on testing should trigger a full diagnostic interview. And uh, prevalence of depression of 10% uh, in the primary care population, and 20 to 40% of those screen that screen positive will have major depression. So let's talk a little bit about therapeutics. Uh, and before we get to the therapeutics, labs that we order when we see our patients here in the office, simple things. A lot of times it's reviewing um, their chart and not ordering redundant testing and redundant imaging. And so if we're seeing microvascular changes in a CAT scan a year ago that was done because they had a fall, then you know, that along with the clinical data, um, we usually determine, you know, what the treatment might be. And so, and a lot of times, you know, what I tell the patients is whether uh, dementia, which, you know, neurocognitive disorders, dementia, there's a variety of those, but the treatment options are pretty similar to what we do for each one of them, uh, especially when it comes to therapeutics, you know, and can they exist together? We see a lot of mixed, you know, there could be Alzheimer's type, there could be uh, the vascular dementia type as well. Those are the two common, most common mixed dementias that we see. And the treatments, uh, of course, in the vascular, we want to improve their, you know, their diabetics, we want to improve their heart health as well as their blood pressure. Uh, and then in regards to Alzheimer's type, limited data again, um, limited amount of therapeutics. Cholinesterase inhibitors have been around for the longest time. And they are, what they do is they treat the symptoms by preventing the breakdown of acetylcholine. Uh, we have Aricept, generic named Inepizo, which is approved for all stages of dementia. And so we start them early and they can 
continue to remain on that until you know the patient is advanced, advanced, as there are some you know, studies that have shown that they continue to improve their function as well. So if the patient is still walking, if the patient is still moving, you know, whether they're self-propelling in a wheelchair, they're doing uh, things and we leave them on it, um, of course, and if they don't have side effects from it. Patients that have GI side effects, um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, second in line is Exelon. Exelon comes in uh, Topical patches, you know, patches that need to be removed every 24 hours, and there are lesser side effects as it bypasses the GI tract. And so then we have Namenda glutamate regulator. It regulates the glutamate uh, in our um, brain, in our synapse, and it is used for moderate to severe um, cases of dementia, of course, and we also use it, you know, um, off-label in the mild cases if my mild case patient does not tolerate um, the, the nepazil. And then uh, lastly, most recently in February of this year, we had um, basically aducanumab, which you know is an anti-amyloid antibody, IV infusion, but due to its side effects, uh, it is not being used, not recommended. We don't treat patients with the IV here. Hershey doesn't really use it either, neither does Hopkins. Uh, it's, so it's very limited uh, who is using it currently. So because of the side effects, it causes bleeding, uh, brain hemorrhage. It, although it's small, there, you know, of course, then we would see effects of the bleeding, which would be the vascular, you know, changes that we would see in the brain. And it can also cause swelling in the brain. So we are currently not recommending or using that. Of course, then there are the non-cognitive symptoms of dementia and they can present early or late. Every patient is different. Uh, so behavioral changes, psychological changes, hallucinations, delusions, sleep-wake cycle disturbance, agitation. And when we talk about hallucinations and delusions, of course, that can go along with their vision as well. So vision impairment can kind of feel like they're seeing things, but yet they don't have the associated uh, full cognitive changes. So there's a lot to kind of, you know, uh, discern and pull away from that um, as well. So there are no, initially for all patients, we try non-drug strategies. If they fail, uh, there's nothing that's FDA approved for treatment of this. So we then continue, we start using um, medications that are used in psychiatry, such as Seroquel. Uh, we use Risperdal. Again, very low doses. These are older patients. Um, and you know those patients are seen frequently just to make sure we're monitoring them for sedation or any other side effects that we can that we see from these types of medications. And so, you know, cognitive health treatment should be tailored towards an individual patient instead of adopting a standard sledgehammer for all cases. And together, um, and I cannot emphasize enough, you know, patients come back over time and time again, what can we do? What, what do you recommend? And so we re constantly go over, you know, are you doing your physical exercise, cognitive exercises? eating right and social engagement um, can improve cognition and preserve it. Uh, so, and by preserving it, we're, you know, how do we preserve it? It can, you know, improve the plasticity of our brain. And so it is absolutely important, you know, along with, you know, it's not simply here's an Aricept, I'll see you back in one month. Most of my time is spent, you know, talking about a healthier lifestyle, staying active, you know, and we saw when we talked about social engagement and how it causes worsening in our cognition, we saw that in the pandemic. So over the last two years, patients were isolated from their families. They were isolated from the senior centers. They were isolated from uh, their churches. You know, they just were isolated and we saw worsening depression and worsening cognition. 
So it is absolutely important um, that to want, you know, all four of those things, when they work together, they continue to improve our cognition, our brain health. Um, and that's what I have this morning, guys. Do we have any questions? Dr. Patel, I'm going to ask you at this time to unshare your screen. And by doing so, you'll be able to bring up the chat and you'll see some questions already posed by audience members there. If you can, I'll help you. I I see it. I mean, it just it's hard to see all the questions though. What about mm -hmm. see Dr. Bernal poses the question uh, as to whether or not you record uh a, if upper extremity use and transfer, can you see that question? Uh, yeah, so I find it helps with posture mobility, not just bladder and bowel. Absolutely. You know, any movement, all the programs, uh, aquatics are great. It ab absolutely helps. I see, you know, um, in the silver sneakers program at the gym, very important. You know, they can go to the gym uh, for patients that cannot make it there, though. Uh, we always have to give them a little advice on what they can do at home as well. So absolutely, I am all for any movement that we can, you know, instill in our patients. And uh, posture, it improves posture and mobility. Deep breathing exercises improves their uh, ability to manage stress. Absolutely, very important. Um, what fruits do you advise for diabetic patients? I have many diabetic patients who are afraid to eat fruits. Absolutely, you know, and fruits. So, you know, fruits have fructose and fructose is not something that's metabolized, you know, by our liver. So it kind of turns it into cholesterol, pushes it out. It worsens our uh, belly fat, if you will. And so it's not, when consumed in great amounts, it's not good for them, uh, but they can have blueberries, you know, a handful of blueberries, uh, strawberries, small amounts of fruit is okay to eat even for our diabetic patients. It just doesn't mean that they can have fruits, a bowl of fruit for breakfast and a bowl of fruit for lunch. But if they use fruit, you know, on a salad or you know, have a salad with nuts and some berries, it's okay to eat that much fruit, you know, eat a little bit of fruit every day. Don't be afraid of it. It is, you know, it's not as bad as glucose, which, you know, which is all white sugar. If they really want to cut back on glucose, it would be cutting back on white breads, white sugars, white pastas. And so absolutely, they can have, you know, berries, they can have some every day. Blueberries are great. They're highly, uh, they are very high in antioxidants as well. Um, and so I have read, Dr. Bernal, um, I have read studies for, for bone health does not help without resistance training. Absolutely, yeah. So exercise along with supplementation, you know, exercise is something, you know, even if you're not supplementing, exercise is great for our bones. You know, exercise is great for our, our brain and our, our bones. It's, you know, it improves everything along the way, in, improves our heart as well, heart health as well. And so, you know, supplementation is only necessary. I mean, obviously we need a lot of calcium, uh, vitamin D uh, to improve our bone health after a certain age. But some of the vitamins are also in, if we look at a healthy diet, they are also in, um, a lot of micronutrients are in the vegetables and fruits that we eat. So, you know, absolutely important. Absolutely. Uh, so let's see. Do you record a patient's use their upper extremities to transfer to sitting? No, we don't record specifically. Uh, but in rehab, we do uh, record what they're doing occupational therapy wise and physical therapy. So occupational is more the fine motor and our physical is more of the gross motor movements. And so we do have specific recordings there, uh, not in the office here. We do more of the get up and go test. And a lot of it is, you know, what they tell us clinically what they're doing. And I give them feedback on what they should do and then review it when they come back. Um, and so, 
Did I answer all the questions? Uh, there's another question if you have a moment regarding yeah. uh, guidelines for screening yep. and treatment of osteoporosis based on age and life expectancy. Can you comment? I don't have, right. So guidelines for discontinuity screening treatment for osteoporosis based on age, life expectancy. I don't have guidelines for screening for osteoporosis. We do it case by case basis, you know, of course. And when we look at the DEXA scans, you know, there are, um, so if you look at the DEXA scans of the hip, the vertebral area, and looking at what the results are for each of those area, we can guide the patient that way. But a lot of times when I talk to my patients, if they don't have a DEXA scan, it it's talking about how much are calcium are you thinking you get in a day, you know, whether it's through dairy products or through, um, you know, vegetables. Most of it is in our patient population, it's dairy products. And a lot of the times, I don't know why we just lost lights, but um, here they are again. But essentially our patients, you know, they if they tell me they are drinking milk twice a day and having ice cream in the evening, that is not enough, you know. So then take one 600 milligram of calcium and vitamin D tab. Patients, in, in order to reduce medication uh, pill burden, if you will, so a lot of times we will do vitamin D 50,000 once a month. Again, this is not for fracture prevention. It is for bone health. A lot of this is more for improving our bone health. I, you know, again, going back to my presentation and what the most recent study by New England Journal was that they did not see much improvement uh, in patients that were supplemented for vitamin D. So a lot of it is individual patient approach and what we, uh, you know, you know, if they're not getting enough in their diet, then let's try to improve it by supplementing it a little bit. Andre. Andy, I did have a question for Dr. Patel. Please. Hi, Dr. Patel. Good morning. Hi, Dr. Uh, hi. So listen, um, so for aducanumab, my read was that, uh, and I was excited about this because we finally had a medication that might address the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's, but the primary outcome was improvement in the neuroimaging. So have they, have they shown improvement in the clinical performance of patients with Alzheimer's treated with aducanumab? Has that been shown? Because that, that, that seemed to be what was lacking to me when it was first approved by the FDA. Now, I, you know, I know when it was approved, it was approved for, you know, patients with mild and uh, any mild, moderate, any kind of uh, cognitive impairment. But we're not recommending it. And also recently we've talked to the geriatrics department at Hershey, uh, Dr. Kaplan also in speaking with her, uh, she in talking to Johns Hopkins, we're not really recommending it because of the bleeding that occurs. The side right. effects are very severe, even right. though they saw benefits, you know, if we treat a hundred patients and 10 have the little bit of brain bleeding that occurs with it, that would, you know, guarantee that that patient now will have vascular changes to the brain. And then we would see, you know, cumulative effects of those over time. Right. And that can, right. you know, of course, lead to cognitive impairment. So yeah, not a lot of good data. I don't recommend it. A lot of it is, you know, my whole uh, treatment plan usually revolves around improving their lifestyle along with you know, I, I don't know how much the Aricep helps or the Nepazil, if you will, or the Memantine, but a lot of it is, you know, every time they come back, a lot of times my patients are on maximum doses of Memenda and Aricep, but when they come back, I want them to, you know, let's review these uh, preventative measures again, you know, how, how can you improve that? You know, they say, oh, I do so many word searches a day. Well, let's find a different hobby. I know it's challenging, but that's what'll keep your brain, uh, you know, uh, challenged and uh, more plastic, elastic, if you will. So, yeah, I think the the most important thing we do for prevention of dementia is control cardiovascular risk factors. And the other thing I do is I keep after my young people uh, to not intoxicate their brains over and over and over again. 
with binge drinking and, and other things. Absolutely, absolutely. That's all great advice. I'm so glad. I almost want to jump in and start doing family medicine half a day, every <laughs> week, right? <laughs> start uh, well, week. thank you very much. I uh, really you, appreciated uh, your presentation today. Thank you. Guys. And on behalf of the entire audience, Dr. Rattel, thank you for share, sharing today. And of course, thank you for taking care of our patients. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Have a great yeah, day. I had a question. Beg your pardon, Dr. Tuck. I had a question. I raised the hand. Oh, hi, Ina. How are you? Uh, hi. Yeah, hi. Sorry, you, I was I was being polite. I raised a hand. Um, <laughs> um, now, what what I wanted to to say is that uh, Pervy like sort of laid a lot of great you know groundwork for what we're doing. I think our hope is is that hopefully in the near future we can have what we would call like a geriatric rehab program. Um, you know, in some ways we have cardiac rehab, we have pulmonary rehab, we have all kinds of sort of programs that try to pull lots of uh, pieces together of a disease process and educate people and sort of manage them in through multiple um, interdisciplinary uh, processes. And this is what we need in geriatrics. We need people to be able to understand sort of health issues that may impact them. We need them to move and to work on physical health and to also teach them what they can uh, do to exercise their mind. And we don't have that at WellSpan. Hoping to, in the future, to kind of do something like that um, as part of a geriatric education process. You know, we, we've talked a lot about dementia, but this other piece that sort of has been parceled out through many departments has, uh, would, I think we, we all think would be better done as a more coordinated program. So that's, that's my plug for what you're doing. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Such a program would be profound in really improving the quality, uh, addressing the quality of life of our aging population and helping us take care of them. Let us know what we can do to help. <laughs> okay. Stay tuned. All right. Later. Light a fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're trying to, so we're going to keep going. You know, we want to improve everyone's health, and I, I can't, you know, thank you guys enough for starting early, like you said, Dr. Andre um, Lajoy, right, Dr. Lajoy. Uh, yeah. That heart health is absolutely important. Managing their blood sugar is absolutely important, and so you know, can't emphasize that enough. Cognitive exercise is very important any exercises physically uh, as well that are very important. Social engagement is also very important. Uh, so again, thank you guys for having me this morning. All right. Thank you, Dr. Patel, and thank you all. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Bye.